Hello, I'm Catherine Armitage, and you're listening to the Sirens of Audio. G'day audiophiles, this is the Sirens of Audio, the podcast dedicated to all things Doctor Who and the audio medium. My name's Dwayne, I'm your host, and joining me is... I'm Philip. G'day everyone, g'day Dwayne. It's uh, great to be back again, and uh, some some great episodes we just had uh, listening to John Dorney. Uh, he's got such uh, a lot of stories to tell, he's been doing so much in the in the world of Doctor Who and Doctor Who Audio in particular over the last 15 years or so. It was fantastic, wasn't it? He was just amazing. Yeah, loved hearing what he had to say. I hope you've enjoyed that as well. And we've got something just as special for you coming up now too as well. Excellent. But before we get into that, I just wanted to run something by you, which I haven't actually spoken to you personally about yet, Philip. And um, I, I bring this up because we're recording on the date that the first sort of full-length release on Big Finish of the Time Lord Victorious series, uh, He Kills Me, He Kills Me Not, has just come out today. And I started listening to that before we we, uh, we came on to record, but I haven't finished it yet. And uh, I wanted to get your thoughts on the whole Time Lord Victorious thing and see what you what your impressions were of that. Are you going to go into more than just the audios? Um, what's your, what are your feelings on Time Lord Victorious? Uh, I think it's a very bold thing that the BBC have come up with, and I can't understand why they want to link things together. I, I think I'm still undecided how much I'm going to get into it. Um, a pr- few programs ago, we had uh, Chris Thompson come on, who's the brand manager uh, looking after all the figures for Time Lord Victorious. And he also was involved with the, mag- the uh, cartoons before that too, so the comics. So I think he has a lot of input in terms of what was going on in terms of all the different mediums. For me at the moment, I'm only interested in the audios. I've already listened to the two short trips, the master ones, which I enjoyed both of them. Uh, so I, I'm kind of treating it, I know lots of fans are a bit concerned about you know, having to buy all this stuff and go across all, all ranges. Uh, I think I'm, I'm going to treat it like going to the Easter show. So out here in Australia, we have a very famous thing called the Sydney Royal Easter Show, which is on for about a week over Easter time. It's gigantic. like it's And there's different sections. So you know, there's rides, there's animals, there's uh, stunt car driving, there's dance performances, there's everything you can imagine. And when I go to this, the Easter show, uh, over the last 40 or so years I've been going, I change what I want to see. And so I just pick at this and I pick at that. And so I'm treating Time Lord Victorious like that. I'm going to go and pick at the things I want to see. And if that inspires me to go broader, well, we'll see what happens. Um, Big Finish has often trapped me. You know, when I started uh, (laughs) with the first audio science of time, I had no intention of listening to anything else, certainly no intention of uh, listening to any Benny. And then they stuck a couple of Benny episodes in with the Seventh Doctor and suddenly I thought, oh, I like this character. And now, of course, I'm obsessed with Benny as well. Um, countermeasures, yeah, once again, I had no intention of doing that and it's caught me. So I am a bit of a slave to uh, passions and what's going on. So we'll see what happens. But I'm, I'm excited by the audio stuff. And if it, it leads me elsewhere, we'll see. The thing with the spin offs, though, is they're not just collectible things, they are actually really good stories. And that's what got me, particularly when you mentioned countermeasures there. And I thought, oh, yeah, interesting characters for that one off episode with the seventh doctor but when i heard countermeasures and the quality of those stories really dragged me in same with well jago and lightfoot are pretty charismatic characters but their stories are brilliant as well so all these spin-offs i was even surprised that i actually enjoyed uh rose tyler the dimension canon last year i thought oh this is going to be just uh something else Uh, i mean big finish gets criticized quite a lot for kind of milking every single corner of the doctor who universe that they can and I, I, I suspect that those who are critical of Big Finish coming up with, I mean, 
I think there was, I, I saw some comments about the Rory box sets that are coming out soon, um, the Lone Centurion. I, I suspect that these ones that are critical haven't actually stepped into these box sets and delved in and and uh, really sunk their teeth into the stories themselves because the thing with the Doctor Who universe is that the stories are limitless and if they're done well, then you're going to be very well invested in them from, from very quickly into the story. That's what I found with most of the spin-offs and they're all high quality. Can't really, they can't really go too wrong with the, I think, with the spin-offs. See, I think that's part of the problem, Drain. I think people are free to buy or not buy, it's up to them. But the trouble mm. is, it's so good. <laughs> and you get caught, and and yeah, you know, if if they if you just didn't care about the Rangers because they weren't that good, you wouldn't care. But once you start listening to something, you actually go, oh, this is actually really great. So you know, after um, Zagreus, Gallifrey caught me, and I had to get all of Gallifrey, and I'm a completist as well. Um, but of course, it's it's your choice. You you don't need to have it all, but it's nice what you can listen to, what you can guess, and they just do too too good a job too often. They can't be the odd dud too, let's face it. But in terms of their spin-off series, they've all been pretty... I mean, everything at the moment. You know, Jago Lightfoot, Benny, uh, Robots at the moment. What an amazing series that is. Um, they just oh, don't... Th- speaking of robots, we, when we were yes. speaking with John a couple of days ago, I asked the question, are we going to have Pool and Toos back again? Um, because I had no idea, and I wasn't sure what the situation is with David Collings passing away. But yes, the cover was released. Pool and Toos, Toos are on the cover uh, and that's fantastic news. Yes, so obviously a bit more recording with David before he passed away. So, yep, that is fantastic news. Because that mm. one episode they did in the last box set was just a joy. Mm. So I hope they've got quite a bit of him. I hope, don't know how lot much they've got, but yeah, at least in the next box set. Brilliant. Absolutely. And today's special guest is uh, pre- pretty exciting. She's uh, quite heavily involved in Big Finish acting and writing, just like John Dorney. Um, that's Jane Slaven. So I'm going to throw in a trailer of something that she's uh, been in recently right here, and then we'll come back with Jane. Coming soon from Big Finish Productions, Doctor Who, The Fourth Doctor Adventures, Season 8, The Syndicate Master Plan, Volume 2. This place is filled with moths. <laughs> Have you seen the doctor? The last time I saw him, the director was giving him some form of new treatment. Typical. Oh. Leaving us to do all the work. Agent Jason Vane. In a life like mine, I don't have time for dreaming. My days are filled with danger, and when night comes, I gratefully accept oblivion. Danger, master. Danger. I know there's danger, K9. You're stating the obvious again. Gas. Not gas. Missed. Quickly, don't breathe it in. Run, run! Mr. Colwyn. How can I be of help? What do you know about the syndicate? All right, you've got my attention. We really do want to know what you've heard about them. And you think I'm just going to blurt that out on an open channel? Fingers crossed. I will crush your ship down to a singularity. We did no testing on Time Lords. Maybe this is an opportunity. Big Finish. We love stories. Well, listen, I just want to thank you so much for coming aboard and having a chat with us. Looking really forward to talking to you. Oh, it's my pleasure. Great. So, yes, thank you. I want to welcome uh, Jane Slaven on board. Uh, I guess most of us know you as companion to the fourth Doctor. You're the first right. companion uh, given to the fourth Doctor that wasn't one from the TV series. Um, but before we get, we get to talk about that, I'd love to hear a little bit more about you and your background. Um, how, how did you become an actor in the first place? Um, I feel like I was never not one. Um, my, my dad took the whole family to the theatre pretty much every week from when I was about six or seven. And we went to see really inappropriate things for our ages and um i loved it uh, you know right from the start and we're a big telly family as well we like to watch telly together and um yeah so it was just always i always knew that's what i wanted to do and particularly audio i used to have a tape recorder i used to have several tape recorders several microphones and i'd record all the parts um 
separately and then mix it all together. Um, it aged about six or seven. Wow. Um, so, <laughs> so I kind of, I got what I wanted really. Um, and yeah, I, I went to drama school, uh, in England and, um, yeah, I started work the day I left college and I've not looked back and I've been quite lucky during lockdown as well to, to carry on because, you know, the industry's on its knees. So I feel really quite lucky. I keep pinching myself. That's great. Now, as I was doing a bit of research, I realized the first time I actually encountered you, I didn't like you very much, uh, which was in the bill. Oh, oh, well, that's okay. Playing the super. <laughs> You're going to say we'd we'd met and you hated No, we me. haven't met. Like, but, oh. but, but, the, but I actually remember your role very strongly in in the bill. Um, which me was, and my, which which role the, did I? Because I played the, about six characters. Oh, really? Okay, so yeah. Superintendent Susan Devlin. So you were the one in charge oh, of yeah. Sunhill Fire, and you were was, mean yes. and rotten to all my characters who I liked. <laughs> Trust me. <laughs> You know, I like those guys as well. It, it was quite a shocking time because the, they had been, um, it, the bill was under new management and tons of people had been fired, uh, literally fired. And you know, they, they blew things up in a fire and they... And, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, and they, you know, they would be getting their, their notice on their way to makeup saying, this is what's, <laughs> this is what's happened. It was awful. So it was quite a, quite a bizarre experience to go in and be the one, you know, investigating the deaths and also n- knowing that, you know, nobody was safe in that building and they, we didn't feel safe either. I, right. In fact, I don't even remember how it was resolved because I don't think my contract extended long enough to find out how they all died. So I don't even remember the result. The storyline went on for six or 12 months after you left. Ah, right. So, yes, no, I, I, no I, yeah, you were there at the start of it all being pretty awful to everyone. <laughs> um, <laughs> but then the person responsible they didn't want to get rid of. And so that character just stayed for another, I think, another 12 oh. months. Who was responsible? Des Tavener was the one who he was trying to, he, he'd, um, he, he'd had in some counterfeit notes. And he, and he threw in some a firebomb to try and burn them off, and in the process blew up the station. Oh but anyhow, people aren't probably wanting to listen to the bill. But I just <laughs> <laughs> as soon as I saw your photo, I, it clicked. I thought, ah, oh, that's where I know you. Oh, it's <laughs> here. <laughs> now I believe your first Doctor Who recording though was with the Paradise of Death. Is that right? It long, was, long yeah. Um, it, that was in the nineties. And I didn't really know, I didn't know about the world of Doctor Who. I mean, I knew I'd watched Doctor Who. Tom Baker was my doctor. Um, And so I knew of it, but I didn't realise what a big thing it was. I couldn't, because there was one day when we had photographs and we never had photographs for radio. Uh, But John Pertwee and Liz Sladen got their costumes on. And they were their original costumes. And I thought, how weird is that? But of course, now I know it's not weird. That's what they do. So um, what was it like working with John Pertwee? Oh, it was fabulous. I mean, he was very, he was very grand. He was, he was, oh, darling. If you go to this restaurant in Chiswick, just mention my name and they'll let you in. You know, it's that kind of thing. Um, I don't know if anybody ever does that. You know, when someone says, yeah, just mention my name. Can you imagine going in and saying, I just uh, work with John Pertwee. Could I have a meal <laughs> here, please? Um, but no, he was fabulous. And because the, the brigadier was there as well. Nicholas um, Courtney. He, yeah, Nick Courtney was in it. And so it, I was aware that they were legendary. You know, and they'd, they'd got a whiff of legend about them. And I'd worked with, I knew Liz really through Brian Miller because I'd worked yep. a lot with Brian Miller. So she was in really his husband and her, her, his wife. And also she'd been Tom's assistant companion for quite a while, hadn't she? So Two, two and a half years she was Tom's companion oh, and one year with John. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. So, yeah. So it was quite, it was quite magical and a bit, and a bit, odd i didn't realize 
I didn't realize the ramifications. I didn't realize that I would still, I still get mail from fans about Paradise of Death. What was the recording like? Was it the old traditional, all of you stand around the microphone and... Yeah, it was like um, regular radio because it's different. Big Finish do it differently, but the Big Finish are kind of the only ones who do it so differently. Uh, so this one was, um, yeah, conventional. It was in um, the BBC. I think I think we recorded at Made of L Studios. Um, uh, yeah, that's yeah. It was. It, it was like an ordinary radio and then I realized much later it wasn't because I put my script in the bin to be recycled and about four people went no what are you doing what are you doing <laughs> I pulled my script out of the bin it's like oh okay that's the way it goes so and do I you thought, still have it no no I gave it to one of them I thought well do you take it then love if you want it and sure enough about a year ago uh, one of the scripts turned up on eBay. As they, they do. Trying to, they were trying to hawk it for 100 quid or something. I don't know. So you've done an awful lot of radio work. Um, <laughs> do other radio works progress for yeah, that many years, 20 years or more? Uh, uh, other, other radios? Yes. Um, n n really not, no. I mean, unless you get some, you know, fervent radio fan who maybe re remembers, you know, uh, Sherlock Holmes or something. But, um, and again, it's, it tends to be the ones people recall are the ones that um, are quite culty anyway, like Sherlock Holmes and Agatha Christie and um, Shakespeare, I guess. Mm -hmm. So how did you end up getting involved with Big Finish? Um, David Richardson uh, uh, found me on a list, I think this is how the story goes. He found me on a list of Carlton Hobbs winners because he usually um, brings in the, the winners of the Carlton Hobbs because that's a radio award and it's given to, it used to be, when I did it, it was given to two drama school leavers each year and the contract was six months at the BBC. And he, uh, the winning it kind of guarantees that you know your way around a microphone and that you've got some kind of versatility S certainly my experience of I don't want to say that about myself but certainly my experience of all the other Carlton Hobbs is, is that they are just fabulous on a microphone uh, so and I think that's how David found there have been quite a few of us from the Carlton Hobbs award who've done big finish so I think I think that's how he found me well, I'm assuming you're very versatile because when I look where you started initially, um, you were playing three, four roles per story and looking through your, just the Tom Baker series, you're yeah. on a, uh, nearly every single CD. <laughs> I know. I didn't even realise. I just do them and then forget about them. And then they arrive in the post and, you know, before you know it, you've got a mountain of CDs. You think, oh, I don't, I don't even remember being in that one. That's fantastic. And I was an ancient nun or something, or you know, yeah, it's it's been great. What's what's your relationship with Tom Baker like? Because I, I get the impression of the reason why you are they created the companion band Kelso for you was because of your relationship with Tom Baker before that. I think it helps that we really laugh together. We. Um, you know, he's a very funny man. Um, uh, I think it helps just that we really, really laugh. Um, but then the whole Big Finish team does. And um, we, even though he's the doctor, it is a proper ensemble. It is a team. And obviously he's our hero and the, the leader, as it were. But um, the, the, the team atmosphere is is really everything a big finish one of the things i've really missed during lockdown although we've managed to record a ton of stuff is the green room experience where you know it'll be me and nick briggs and david richardson and tom baker and some other actors and it's just a joyful experience you know it's not just we don't all just sit and listen to tom it's funny and bantery and 
um you know it's just it's really lovely so i think i fit into that team um and that's that's kind of how it evolved and yeah tom and i really do get on you know i adore him he's so he's so he's kind and funny and so intelligent and so sharp and bright and is well, he's wonderful you were able to work with Mary Tam before she passed away too. What, what are some of your memories of, of Mary working with her? <laughs> Mary and I were great friends um, way before Big Finish. Um, we met, I can't remember when we, I think we met on a low budget movie in the 90s. And I'd always adored her. We shared the same birthday, a few years apart. Um, and she was very funny. And we just, we were really good friends. We spoke a lot on the phone. And she, she really helped me a lot. Um, she, um, she was very kind, furiously witty and a laugh. We shared the same laugh, pretty much. Um, so yeah, I worked with Mary. I think I worked with her on a couple of things, but we we just remained really, really good friends. Um, I'm I really miss her. I really miss her. When she died, I couldn't quite because she didn't tell anyone she was poorly, and I couldn't couldn't believe that she would go without telling me. So I I remember phoning her phone and leaving a load of messages. And then eventually phoning her husband and saying, what, what's going on? And Because, you know, Marcus, obviously, Marcus died as well the day of her funeral. The, yes, I know. Um, Mary wasn't, she was actually too ill to be in studio, though, wasn't she? We didn't, we didn't, um, I think I may have even read in for Mary uh, at one stage. Um, she did go into studio. Um, but she didn't tell anyone she was she was poorly. I think David Richardson, David's so sensitive and gorgeous and fabulous. Don't I hope he never listens to this and hears me saying wonderful <laughs> things about him. Um, but he's so sensitive and he said he had got an inkling that something wasn't right. But really, nobody knew. She, even her daughter didn't know how, quite how ill she was. So it was a great shock to us all and in, just an enormous loss. Coming soon from Big Finish Productions. The Fourth Doctor Adventures. Doctor Who. The Auntie Matter. So now the TARDIS is flitting randomly throughout time and space. Yes, until the Black Guardian gets tired of chasing it, and then it will return to us here in London. Eventually. Still, it doesn't matter. I was just going to let him know that I was heading down to... Where was it again? Bassett on Hamble. Yeah. Somewhere just outside of it is called Bassett on Hamble. This is your place. Well, it's my country seat. Bassett Hall, you see. The current owner is my aunt, though she's come over a trifle odd of late. <laughs> I have more aunts than I know what to do with. Just when I think I have the set, another one pops out of the woodwork when least expected. They're like mice. The errant doctor. Yes. I was wondering how long it would take until you turned up. Give me a moment and I should be able to set it to overload. Oh, I won't pretend to have a clue what you're doing. Auntie, please, you must stop this. The poor fellow will die. That is rather the point, you abysmal goof. That's it. Are you sure? Nothing seems to be... Subscribers get more at bigfinish.com. Yes, she was an amazing actress. Re a brilliant actress. Just a brilliant actress. And, you know, she was writing her memoirs and she, yeah. Yeah. Ah, uh, I, yeah. I, 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 I think I was impressed that even knowing she was so sick, she was still prepared to do those eight stories. Uh, as a final sort of farewell thank you for the for the fans, which was, yeah, she didn't need to do. Oh, yeah. 
absolutely. It's a, it's a lovely legacy she left behind for us. Yeah, absolutely. Um, also, she would have done anything to... She loved to work. She really loved to work. And she loved what Romana had given her. And she loved um, the, the trappings, in a good way, of the Doctor Who world. Which I'm sure people who aren't in this world don't realise the <laughs> you're in a big family like it or not one as soon as you join you're in the family which is lovely isn't it it is you get strange people from across the world saying can we talk to you <laughs> yeah yeah and really you know most people have been really very kind i don't i'm sure i'm sure some people have been awful but most people have been really kind and lovely and you know, one of my best friends I met, I didn't realise he was a Doctor Who fan. I thought he was a friend of a friend. And he Facebooked me and said, oh, you know, do you want to go to the theatre sometime? Um, <laughs> and I got, I got to the theatre. And just before I got to the theatre, I texted the friend who we were mutual friends with. And I said, you know, well, how do you know him? We'd, I'm just, you know... I've just decided, I was having a yes week. I was saying yes to everything. I said, how do you know this guy? And they said, we don't. He's just a Doctor Who fan. <laughs> <laughs> so I just ended up going out to, to dinner in the theatre with, with just this fan who became one of my best friends. Oh, that's an exciting way of going about things. Yeah. And then, because then I thought, oh my goodness, what if he's mental? You know, what if he's a stalker or, but you know, he was, he's a lovely guy. He's a family man and um, he's very sweet. And, but you know, we got on really well. And that was about, I don't know, four years ago now. And he's, yeah, he's one of my best friends. Brilliant. Hilarious accidental friendship. Now getting um, the role of Anne Kelso, having, well, having, having the role written for you, um, what was it like knowing you were playing the second lead for a whole series? Um, it was so thrilling. It was so thrilling. I remember getting the text message from David Richardson and he said, we're, we're thinking of getting a new companion for Tom. And I was so jealous and just thought, why, why, why can't it be me, me? Um, and then uh, over a series of texts, he <laughs> let me know, actually, yeah, it is you, Jane, you idiot. <laughs> um, uh, and I was so, I was really thrilled. I was thrilled that, that these people who I really love and respect were giving me this gift. It felt like a, such a generous gift. And, uh, you know, it can't be undone. I will always be... Uh, companion to the fourth doctor you know whether or not we die or are re regenerated or whatever happens to the companions you can't ever take it away from us and it was just the most wonderful feeling um and that it was with tom was like uh, a dream come true i remember seeing tom on daytime tv about i don't know 25 years ago and thinking oh God, I, why, why, I want to work with this man. He's so witty and funny. He was being interviewed. Um, and, you know, here I am now, 25 years later. Tick, tick that wish off. How many wishes do you get granted? Thanks, David Richardson. Pretty exciting. I um, got to meet Tom when I was nine years old. <gasps> um, and it was, it's, it's still one of those uh, strong memories in my head. But um, he was eccentric yeah. back then, but just, yeah, so caring for people and, yeah. He really is. People. Yeah, he really is. He really, he gives, uh, he gives the room rather than takes it, you know. He's, um, yeah, he's, he's very kind. And he, and he adores, he, again, he, you know, I think to, Doctor Who, for some of the actors in the 70s and 80s, may have felt at the time like a weight round their neck. And now he sees it as a great gift. Mm. Now, we want to encourage people who haven't listened to the season to go and listen to the whole season. But I guess one of the advantages of having a, a companion that the big finish have written for themselves is they could actually give you a strong character arc 
which they yeah. couldn't quite do with other companions. They've got to sort of leave them where they pick them up from. Of so course, your they never saw it like that. Yeah. Mm. So, I mean, your character's a very, very strong arc over the <laughs> eight episodes. <sighs> Um, yeah. So much so that, um, and I, I guess this is kind of a spoiler, but it's out there because we know it's happening, is that um, Anya Kingdom, uh-huh. uh, who you ended up being by the end, is now coming back to do a series of box sets with David Tennant and another one with Tom. I know. Um, how lucky am I? <laughs> <laughs> so how's the recording? What can you tell us? How's the recording been going? Um, <laughs> I can't tell you anything except that you know the, the, that we recorded over lockdown, um, so we did record separately. Um, but uh, which do you want to know about the David Tennant one? Well, t- t- I think it's a prequel with Tom Baker first. Is that right? I think so. Uh, I think it's uh, yes, there some, is. Yes, some, there some is. Some of the dials. I'm trying to think what it's called. Uh, you're there is. Me now. It's been released. Um, so it's not uh, Dalek Universe. Um, is it the Dalek uh, Protocol? Yes. I think it's called. And it's yeah, yeah. So it's got yeah. it's got you, got I'm, Louise Jamis in it. Yeah. Um. So that's that's already been. I'm, I'm assuming the fact the covers out has been recorded and up and out, out and about. That yes, they've all been recorded. David the the David Tennant series has been recorded. Um, and so the whole series has been recorded. All three. Yeah. Boxes. Everything. Oh yes. Wow, that's a lot of work. I know. Oh, it was, it, it, yeah, it really was. And we recorded in the heat wave during lockdown, and we were all um, hiding in David, Yeah, David Tennant was under a duvet. Um, so we were all very hot. Joe Sims had a duvet over him. I was in my wardrobe, which I had lined with um, acoustic foam. Um, so yeah, it's um. Oh, we had such fun though, and the scripts are wonderful. Um, really wonderful and dark and funny and just really quite beautiful. You know the trailer for the Dalek Universe when David's just giving this gorgeous monologue. I mean, that's the essence of um that series. It's it's quite profound. It was quite moving, especially given that, you know, everything's moving. We're in this global pandemic and you feel like, the, you know, we're all going to hell in a handcart. Uh, it, was, it was quite profound and, and really beautiful scripts. So how does lockdown recording work? Are you all, are you all on screen together? So you're still acting off each other? Are you... Is, is it like working in the booths in the studio? How different is it? It's it's quite like working in the booths because, you know, we don't face each other. The, with the way Big Finish records it, we all record on separate mics so that they can lift people out and distort them and make them alien-y. Um, so so we, we're not looking at each other when we're recording in studio. And um, we weren't looking at each other when we were recording in lockdown because initially we started recording on Zoom um, and found that actually there was a better way of doing it. So now we use clean feed and everyone is recording. And we also record separately onto our devices. So we're we're all recording onto a computer somewhere as well, just so there's a backup. backup. Yeah. Um, So far... I think those backups have rarely been used um, because clean feed works so well. I don't have shares in clean feed. I wish <laughs> I did. <laughs> but you are uh, all recording on at the same time, just on your different devices in different places. We are, unless there's an actor. I think it's, I think it's well known now that if there's an actor unavailable, like if it's Tom and Lala and they're not available at the same time because they, they used are. to be married. What a so coincidence. Coincidence, it's never available to I know. Ever. I know. So, um, so then someone will read in with that actor uh, at another time. Or, or maybe there are three or four that you could do at the same time, but the, you'd, never, you wouldn't, you'd never record in complete isolation. So what's it like working with David Tennant? Oh, it's love. He's lovely. I mean, yeah, he's, um, he really has a strong work ethic. He's, he loves it. He doesn't need to do this, you know. It's not the best paid job in the world. 
he uh, he has other opportunities but he loves it and it shows and it's really nice working um with that level of enthusiasm and commitment i've worked with david before on the radio um uh we did a series called believe it with richard wilson and um uh so i've worked with him a few times actually but not for 10 15 years um and so and then we did this and also it's very intimate you know you're sitting there with um your headphones on and you you're listening to each other and it's that no intimacy is lost just because we're just on cans so so you managed to work so, so john pertry tom bacon david tennant so far uh i think you'll find i've worked with peter davison as well oh okay and and john hurt oh that's right you did the war <laughs> doctor you're right <gasps> sorry i haven't worked with sylvester but i have had dinner with him at a big finish thing but i know well, that doesn't count if oh, I'd, I've, maybe I've, if I'd re- I've had, if I've I'd, I'd recorded, too, so I don't oh, think <laughs> it's Sylvester a bit of a floozy then, so he just goes. Oh, he is. It. No, he's good fun. He's Left, right, fun. And center. He's lovely, isn't he? Yeah. So I'm, I'm trying to get all the living doctors. Yeah, onto well, you, my you've even managed one of the non-living doctors, so you've done very well. I know, I know. There aren't many of us who can say we've worked with John. Now I believe Andy Keenan also crops up in the Diary of River Song series coming yes, out he in does. Yes. Chan as well. <laughs> Yeah. So you're getting round, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Oh, yes. I was, I, without giving any spoilers away, at the end of the Anne Kelso story, I was pretty devastated at where we could go, you know. But then you realise, you know, I was thinking, well, where can we go? What can I do now with this character? Um, uh, and then you realise, it's Doctor Who. We can do anything. We can go back in time. We can go forward we can literally do anything and that's what they've done and Anya Kingdom uh, Anya Kingdom has the uh, just a uh, without giving anything away um, a fantastic trip as an actor so she's you know her her arc is quite glorious to play well, I thought your arc had been pretty good in the in that one season, but it felt like an yeah. end. And now it just did looking, feel like an end. I didn't like that so finite much, thing. There's so much coming up; it's astounding. Yeah. Um, just oh, in terms yeah. of acting, one, one last thing I've just been listening to also in Callum. Oh yeah. Um, now that's a very different role in terms of the slightly more passive 60s female 70s female <laughs> i know i quite like doing those passive 60s females you know you know <laughs> there's something quite genteel about it i shouldn't wonder you know they, they all they all have a kind of clipped voice about them slightly different from now um yeah i love doing that ben miles is great he was great um, you do seem yeah. to play with ben miles very well the two of you have very great. Uh, you know, I love your scenes together, locked up in um, different sort of. Was it, it was the room I love, um, the filing room, the discussions in the filing room. Oh, yeah, no, I loved it. And it, it, weirdly, d- during it, because we did the last season in lockdown, and weirdly, it was, um, uh, it felt more comfortable doing it not in front of each other than the first season. I mean, the first season was great. It was just, you know, um, for some reason, it felt more relaxed to do it. Like we really knew each other. I didn't, we didn't know each other at all. Um, We'd never worked together. Um, And it was very quick, the first season. Um, And the second season, somehow we were all in it together. We were all locked down and, you know, the, the <laughs> actors we're really very very appreciative of the work you know any any time of our lives but particularly during um a lockdown when you know the the rest of our business is closed down pretty much so yeah it was gorgeous i loved it and i think he's such a good actor from big finish productions callan volume two you're scotch 
Sir Galahad. Up yours, Lancelot. Well, this is nice, isn't it? <sighs> what are we doing? Uh, Socialising. Well, I mean, turning over birds' drums isn't nice, Mr. Kellen. But consider this, you'll be a peeping Tom who's hundred quid better off. Well, why didn't you say so in the first place? Hunter's instructions, only you and I are to see the file. It doesn't leave the room and the door must be kept locked at all times. It doesn't say anything about Shin Bet. Shin Bet. There are Israeli equivalents. They're as good as any in the world. Tough, dedicated. Oh! Are you the welcoming committee? St Giles College, Oxford. There's a conference of historians there. Which one do I kill? <laughs> you okay? The thing is, Hunter, I want a guy knocked off in the UK. Did he just say that he wanted to come to England to kill somebody? Move it, Toby! Look out! The Jag's coming past on your right! Birdie shotgun? Big thing like that could make a terrible mess of a small flat like this. It would make a terrible mess of you. It's pointing straight at your midriff. There's always the possibility that you will fail. Then I'll die. Big finish. We love stories. Brace yourself! We're going into the ditch! <laughs> Uh, the, the other thing we would love to talk about is, is your writing, uh -huh. um, because you've you've written a few pieces and a couple of favourites of mine. Um, how did you start getting into writing? Again, a bit like the acting. I've always written um, because I used to write scripts for myself. You know, just even as a child. Um, uh, and then when I was in my twenties, I wrote my first novel. Um, I say first novel, like I'm going to write a second one. I mean, I haven't got round to it now and it's been 20 years nearly. So, um, uh, longer. Um, so I've always written and be David Richardson read my novel and f because of that asked me to write an episode of survivors. So I think actually it was at a girl that was the first one, but survivors was the first one he asked me to write. And I really, really enjoyed writing that. God, such a good series. Have you heard Survivors? Yes, yes. Because you, you um, yeah, brilliant, brilliant series. Because uh, we've been two episodes, I think, uh, what have I got? I've got, uh, oh, Robert in Series 8, which was, you actually got to do one of the death episodes. Which yeah. was so bleak. I can't say that episode was so miserable. <laughs> <laughs> I know. What you, I mean, Robert was such a revolting character. And oh, you, kind yeah. of, you kind of gave him some compassion. But yeah, he tried to work out to save his wife or his mistress. It was just yeah. so bleak and awful. And then, um, oh, and, and then the farm in series nine. So I think it's just two episodes. Or have you done more than that? No, just two. Because then it finished. Yeah. Um, no, I would have loved to have. God, I would have. I'd love to write some more. I think we should revive it and do it on TV. But I think they did, didn't they? And it didn't work. Yes, they did do a season sure. on TV. Yeah. No, I, I've. In fact, I. Um, I re I recently about two weeks ago reread Robert the the episode in season eight because somebody said it's so opposite now with lockdown with the plague and of course it is I mean you know just the fact that there was a lockdown there's a, there's a lot that you know lockdown is mentioned in the first episode and I don't even remember knowing what a lockdown was but obviously I did and now then we got then we got one. Um, but yeah, I loved it. I loved writing about the mental hospital. I loved the, 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 all the grief and torture and also just making it, hopefully, it's quite funny as well. You know, some of the ludicrous scenes, for instance, when they're in the camper van going to Elsie's and the whole scene at Elsie's where they're having dinner. On the water, yeah. You know, yeah, I loved writing all of that. Um, I uh, just got great, great pleasure from it. And then I got to be in it. So, How much of a brief were you given? Because, I mean, I mean Robert was the, the main villain of the, the box set and you were the one who got to write his entire backstory. Were you given much of a brief about who he had no. to be and where he was going? Ex-Army. That was my brief. <laughs> um, and then we had to, um, we had to pitch you know, our, all of our stories. And then they have to be, the stories have to then be okayed by the Terry Nation estate. 
So I was quite scared they would reject you know the mental hospital or you know every I was quite scared they'd reject everything because I suddenly became very attached to this story and suddenly it was very clear to me what I was going to write and how I was going to do it um uh, but it, yeah as, as you know it all went ahead so we, we had um we had like a writer's room where we would um bounce ideas off each other um and that's quite inspiring because you know there are four there were four of us i think for that season and we we're all really different styles different kind of people so it was great to sit in a room with the really different style brains and bash these ideas around and you come out with way more ideas than you go in with and um, i i do a writer's room any day of the week i do it for free it's so rewarding and um you know fruitful Coming soon from Big Finish Productions. Survivors, Series 8. Hope is a difficult thing to find nowadays. My hope is living off rumors. I I'm not sure I could take another letdown, Jenny. They look like kids. This group is organized. I'm looking for my son, Peter Grant. Outlaws! Open fire! We are not abandoning this train. I'll be damned if I'm going to let a bunch of thugs just take it over. We're on the brink of civil war. Outlaws! Get ready to board that train! Yeah. Abby, we're in a fight here. You need to start shooting. Big finish. We love stories. All the years I've been searching, ho holding on to the hope that he's alive. Well, he is, Jenny. And I'm so close to... Speaking of <clears throat> getting a brief, I today for the first time have finished listening to Transference. I know it's been out for a year, but I only just oh. listened to it this week. And um, so I was curious throughout the whole story how you four writers managed to weave the story together. I guess it was probably like a writer's room situation, was it? We did. And what yeah, kind of, we did what the kind same of a brief thing. did you get? Because you did the first two episodes, didn't you? I did, yeah. Oh, and I was lucky, really, because I, I'm not sure, oh, I suppose I could have done it, but I, fe I felt that the other three writers were far more skilled at the whole thriller thing than, than I am. Um, so I could, <laughs> I could set lots of things up and just let them deal with it. <laughs> so... Um, yeah, but we did, we did, we had, we had more meetings for transference because obviously we were trying to work out what was happening and how we could make it happen and these characters. And I got to invent uh, Sam, Alex's character, and um, um, uh, Paul was was straight out of my brain and. I think Keith was given to me. So I think the brief was, I can't, you know, I can't remember. I can't remember what the brief was. I'd just be making it up. Um, <laughs> but we, but again, we didn't, have, we didn't have much to, we didn't have much to go. And it was literally, you're going to write a thriller and she's a psychotherapist. So what do you know um, about psychotherapy beforehand? Oh, I know quite a lot actually. Um, not because I've uh, spent years with a therapist, although I did, I had a ther I did go to a therapist last year. It was very good after my dad died and I went a bit, uh, I got quite depressed. Um, but that's another story. Um, I did for my own pleasure, my dad as a gift bought me um, a course uh, learning how to be um, a person-centered counsellor. So I went and did this course for a year um, and that really helped. It also made me not want to be a, a therapist or a counsellor. <laughs> um, yeah, and also I do find these things attract uh, people who need them. 
<laughs> Strange I'm that. Sure. Yeah. So um, you 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 know when you see people training to be a counselor and you think, okay, that could be my counselor one day. It maybe puts you off a bit. Um. So yeah, I did a I did a years a years a years training pretty much. So in terms of, because there was four of you writers who were all giving two episodes each. So uh -huh. was there someone who had the general storyline? I mean, I, I mean, it's qu quite an intricate, I mean, it feels like one story written by one writer. And then I guess so that's really good. I'm really pleased with that. I'm glad you think that. Um, we did, we knew, we decided on things, you know, we, so we'd go to the writer's room and we'd say, this is what I'm planning um how can this you know and then it's like passing on it's like a relay race you know you pass on the script and then someone someone runs with it and we were all writing them pretty much at the same time um but so when someone had... when someone kills off one of your characters did you care i was devastated bloody john dorney is always killing people um <laughs> and um I think he's never forgiven me. We're on um, on t Twitter yesterday, someone had put, uh, "Who's uh, has anyone ever given you a really bad spoiler?" <laughs> and for some reason, um, I don't know. Years ago, when Game of Thrones first began, I knew one of the actresses. I, I'm not going to give away this spoiler again on this, but I knew one of the actresses, and I knew that she was her character was dead. And I'd never seen Game of Thrones. And I said to John Dorney, assuming he's like the geekiest of all geeks in the whole geekdom, assuming that obviously he would have watched Game of Thrones probably 13 times and would know it by now. And he hadn't seen it. And I'd said, oh, but she's obviously she's not doing it anymore because she had a throat cut. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so I ruined it for him. And he put it on Twitter yesterday. That um, that I I had done the worst spoiler ever. So ever since then, he's been killing off my characters, left, right, and centre. <laughs> and I think I suspect, um, yeah, one of the characters in Transference that I think it was I think it was him that killed him, and I was devastated. Keith Patterson, he's a random liar. He doesn't even try to hide it. Coming soon from Big Finish Productions, a Big Finish original drama, Transference. He's a fantasist? Yeah, maybe. I can't work him out. She says I'm a psycho. I'm not sure he's even using his real name. One minute he's married, then he's divorced, then he's never been married. His kids have had loads of different names and ages. Like they're just a story. Is any of it true? Yes, some bits. Just don't trust anyone. Be careful. Okay, you're making me really uncomfortable now. Good. You should be. Big Finish. We love stories. What if I killed someone? <laughs> oh, Keith! Attic Girl was the other thing that you wrote as well. Does that feel a bit more contained because of um, the, the stories were slightly more separate? They were, they, yeah, they were very separate. Um, the only thing we had to go on there was the, the conceit of having, uh, uh, maybe finding letters and having a flashback to, uh, or flash forward to the present day which I'm not actually sure, can't, I can't remember now if it stayed throughout the series, but, by the, but anyway, mine, that, was what, that was the brief I was given for that. And then the story I could um, just make up. And I was given a list of characters and you know, some of their traits. Um, but mainly I, apart from Rose and uh, Amelia, and made them up. So uh, again, yeah. So is there a process you, you follow? Oh, sorry, go on. 
no 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 uh the the I, you, when you when you're when i was first given it you know you hanker as a writer you hanker for a commission or you you know someone to just say can you please do this for me and you think this is fantastic and then you you face with it and you think oh, what if i can't do it and you still get doesn't matter how old you are you still get this feeling of oh, what if i can't do it and um i remember every time i had a an idea for three or four days i sat down and i would write them on a piece of colored card and i had all these ideas and all these characters started to develop and i put all the cards at the end of the week on the floor and it it was pretty much a script had formed and i'd just been wise enough to actually make the notes as it was forming in my head during the week and then you start to you know knit it together like a jumper so you, your process to start with paper taking notes organizing yeah. notes yeah yeah and, and and walking around thinking about them and thinking about instances and moments very much moments like a moment will start uh, a whole scene which could end up being the most crucial scene in the in the piece and also the um, my episode of at a girl for instance i'd just been reading about the blitz and i was really interested in how the blitz was affecting people psychologically and what you know how, how that would impact on your life not just the fact that you you home's been blown to smithereens but the the um the insecurity the the you know they would have all had ptsd to some degree and that's what i wanted to show in walter who was um the shell-shocked mm. soldier yeah who, who tapped you on the shoulder for that was that was that david Mission or was that louise jemison who um i think louise and helen um we're in conversation with David and he said, Oh, I've got just the person. So had you and, met either uh, before? Yeah. I'd met Helen really briefly. Um, and I'd worked with Louise loads and loads. I love Louise. God, she's just, <laughs> she's amazing. She's a wonderful woman. She's one, she's one of my favorite people at the moment. So <laughs> she really is. She really is. She's just, but she's also in, just insanely talented and could literally play anything you gave her. Yes, we, we've had her come out here to Australia a couple of times and she did, did a performance of a one-woman show for us, which wow. was spectacular because her on stage. Oh. And then last time I was in England, I went and saw her on stage again, um, you know, quite a few drinks afterwards. But just, yeah, spending time watching her perform, she is just, her craftsmanship is astounding. And be it audio, be it on theatre, be it on film, yeah. Um, yeah. just astounding. Yeah, we had, we, we had a big long conversation with her a couple of months ago, and just um, yeah, she's she's very generous with her time too. Yeah, she's brilliant. She's absolutely brilliant. And so was funny. It, and was it good working with her in terms of just the whole collaborative process of what they were creating? It really, and she's um, both she and Helen were so passionate about um, the 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 project it really meant something to them i mean it was louise's idea but helen was there right from the beginning and they're really close friends uh and so it was uh, you know we felt like we were also an all-female team which is just usually until very recently generally you're the only woman in the room um uh so it was wonderful to just sit and have you know Four female brains making this really wonderful series. I mean, I loved it and I listened to it, and it's you know, it's really stunning. I think. It is. I, I think they're making a. I think they're making a TV series. Not unfortunately, not using any of us. But I think that idea, that wonderful idea of those female pilots, is is going to be made into a, a series. It's a shame it's not you guys doing it. Should be. I know. I know. Well, I think Louise did try and sell it, but um, uh, it, for, for whatever reason, it didn't happen. So, 
But as you know, as long as it's out there, we're all quite happy that, well, just, you know, get this story out there because it is, it is amazing. Maybe it will make people buy At A Girl as well. In my, and it's certainly a story I had no idea about. I, sadly, I had no idea of those women and what they did. So it was, I know. yeah, good, good to Some learn about. Some of them about. had 12 hours training and then up in the air, you know, with no navigation, terrible weather, loads of them died. No weapons. Yeah, extraordinary. No yeah. weapons, no respect. <laughs> not very much pay. <laughs> no pay. So, yeah. No, nothing, nothing's not, not much changed. changed. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, how we laughed, but it's true. <laughs> yes, yeah, sadly. It's laugh or cry, isn't it? Mm-hmm. So tell us about your, your, your book. I noticed Big Finish had an audio book that you'd released a few years ago. Mm. Um, tell us about that book and... How is that different to writing a script for you? Um, I suppose the, the main difference is you, you, there's no real deadline for a novel. I, uh, I wrote it before I'd sold it. Normally with a script, you've actually sold it before you write it. So it's already been commissioned, but the book wasn't commissioned. The book was just, I was just writing. I was touring, um, uh, with Romeo and Juliet and uh, an Alan Aitborn play. And I just kept writing all the time. And I realized that it was becoming a novel and that I should just finish it and write a novel. I'd already, I decided, I don't know, when I was about eight, that obviously I'd write a novel. I'm sure loads of people think, yeah, of course I'll write a novel. Anyway, I did. Um, and um, <clears throat> and the reason it became, uh, the reason it became an audio book was because David Richardson read it on Kindle. And um, and then told me afterwards and said, "Oh, I loved it. Please, will you do it as an audio book?" Um, which was quite an interesting experience because it is a bit, huh, um, it's quite intimate. And you you know you write it and don't really expect to ever be in anybody's head while they're reading it, but then when you're doing the audio book, you're telling them the story. So if the main characters, I don't know having a wank or something <laughs> and you're directly imparting that inf information to the listener um which is so intimate even though you know you obviously they're not there when you're reading it it's 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 a bit like reading someone your diary really close up to their ear because say imagine the microphone is the person you're telling you know, so you're giving them this incredibly intimate information, like reading out a diary. It's women writers, though. <laughs> um, I, I, I've been reflecting, <laughs> talking, talking to Louise recently, um, and I was just talking about the, the things that women put into their stories, which men would never put in. So, I mean, you know, Louise has people, you know, in survival, we, you know, girls go off to we together. And yeah. you know, there's periods <laughs> and menstruation and abortion and these amazing topics. I sort of thinking, men just don't do that sort of writing. And then you put a bunch of women together; they're murdering people, laugh like crazy. They're doing all this intimate yeah. stuff. Um, yeah, it, it's it's why, yeah, it's, it's one of the great places. I think the big finish is going increasing its female authors is mm. because it really is taking stories in different directions. And, yeah, um, I think so. Men, men don't go in the same place. <laughs> No, I mean, I think, well, I mean, you know, I think we're all, we all have our strengths, but I see the, the male writers, you know, John Dorney is extremely good at plot and factual details. And, you know, there's incredible details. And Louise, for instance, or I would, would add uh, heart. I mean, obviously, Dawny's really good at heart as well. You know, we've seen in Absent Friends, I think it was. Yeah. Um, and 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 you know, I think he's a great all round writer. Um. Uh. But yeah, we um we do have different strengths and different things to offer. So it makes it really kind of rich as a series when it's a mixture of male and female writers. I think. Yeah, I agree. Obviously, that's you know, it's a general thing, and I know there are exceptions, but you know. yeah, the first Time Lord Victorious big finish release was uh, out today, 
mm-hmm. uh, full, first full cast one written by a female author that I hadn't seen before. And I actually get quite excited now when I see these new um, authors, particularly female authors that I haven't seen before, because mm-hmm. it really is refreshing yeah. um, to, to get well, these different to points of view. Love it. Yeah. Well, James, we just want to thank you so much for your time. We really appreciate it. I think we could keep talking for hours, but we probably should let you go. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's been a real, it's been a real pleasure. I'm really keep listening, and I'm glad you loved transference. And um, actually, I might listen to that. I'm, I'm going on. I'm going for a drive later. I might, I might put it on. I, I never listen to the end, so I'm still not. <laughs> Still don't know, <laughs> you don't know exactly how it, how it ended. I know the I've got the skeleton plot because we we all knew before it was written what was roughly going to happen. But we're all kind um, of hanging out for a sequel because it, it. She's such an amazing character that's been drawn, and the possibilities are so good. And the ending could easily take you on. So yeah, um, I think so. I guess it's all about the sales, though. I guess, and um, I mean, I, th- yeah. I, I applaud, applaud being finished for silly doing their own original works you know what they're amazing they do they they really do support artists they want content um they want it to be quality they not they would never just churn out you know they do such a lot but i would say they never churn they take such great care over the scripts and things. And the original, when they started doing Big Finish originals, I just, you know, you've got to take your hat off to them because who does that? They're so, people are so safe. They want, you know, but they take the risk. Yep. But it's obvious that um, they employ people with passion like you and um, a real love for the arts and love what's going on and long may continue. Yeah. So thank you so much for your time. It's my absolute pleasure. Thank you. London steamed. Its buildings breathed sweat right out into the streets. I could see it happening. There would have been a mass of people peeling away their clothes and seeking out patches of grass all over the city, but it seemed anyone capable of travel had fled to the beach, the country, anywhere other than here. For a fleeting moment that morning, I had wished for a car a family, a lover. But the moment passed and was forgotten and I carried on with my day, content. The phone rang all day long, a hot bank holiday in August when everyone I knew was apparently gripped by chronic boredom or loneliness. I had a lot to do and it would have been wise just to let it go to voicemail, but I picked up every time I heard it howl. My flat was in chaos I was in the middle of decorating it, but was forever waylaid. Sentiment, old clothes, a memory stuffed carelessly between two pages of a book. The phone again. I should also have been looking at a script for the next day's work. September the 1st. It felt like a new year, like a beginning. I saw the London air turning crisp and cool overnight. Summer's end. I watched the sunshine drifting off towards some other city. It would leave without me, as it always did. It generally left me bereft. Around that time of year, I've been known to go quite loopy with desire for eternal summer and fear of the cold and the dark and the winter. But it was not like this then. The job. Yes, the job. Well, it wasn't about to propel me into any dizzying heights of fame and stardom. It was only for a few days, and no one would ever see the finished result. Well, nearly no one. It wasn't that kind of gig. But I was looking forward to it. Four days filming in an ancient studio in Holland Park with a bunch of actors, always a treat, and a director I'd never even met. It would be amusing, if nothing else. It might even pay off a debt or two. I looked around the bedroom to see if I could locate the script under all the debris. I spotted it lying neglected on the bare, part-sanded, paint-splattered floorboards in between the cafetiere and a tin of county cream gloss. I'd moved into the flat about ten weeks before, and then immediately gone away on tour with a play called The Sugar Man, and hadn't even bothered to unpack. The play had then come into town for a little West End limited run and had closed two days ago. I pretended, just to myself really, I'd had no time for practicalities, But in reality, all I'd had to do was show up at the theatre every night and perform for an hour and a half. It wasn't nuclear physics. 
The play was easy and fun and only 90 minutes long. There had been more than enough free hours to sort out my belongings and paint a few walls, particularly as the flat is spitting distance from the West End. But I am lazy, at least I was then. So much time lies between then and now. Well, there we go. That was a great time with Jane. Certainly a lot of experience there. Uh, she's got a great sense of humour. You can really see how and why her and Tom Baker get on so well. And so, yeah, I hope you enjoyed that. Fancy well, we... saying you didn't like her very much when you first <laughs> saw her. <laughs> well, the, the, the role she was playing. I, know, I think I threw her a bit by saying that. <laughs> but yeah, it was the role, it was the role, not her. She played, She was so good that I didn't like her. Anyhow, one of the things we love to do is recommend other things to go have a listen to. So, Dwayne, what would you like to recommend? Well, I'm going to do a musical recommendation this week uh, because of the sad passing of Eddie Van Halen. Um, anyone who knows me knows I like my classic rock and Van Halen's one of those bands that... Uh, everyone's, everyone knows from their later years, but I, I really enjoyed Van Halen in, in, in their earlier years because they, they were around in the 70s, long before Jump was on MTV all the time. Um, so I'm going to recommend an album of theirs called Fair Warning. Um, the opening track is called Mean Street, and once I heard that, um, I, was, I was hooked. I was hooked on that particular album. So I'm going to put a link in the show notes to um, uh, a Mean Street, uh, which is the opening track to Fair Warning by Van Halen. I reckon you should grab a copy of that and give it a whirl if you like your classic rock. What about you, Philip? Well, uh, having just had Jane on, I'm going to recommend some Jane. So if you haven't listened to Callan yet, uh, the box of season one and two, they're both excellent boxes to listen to. Um, she, has, she doesn't play a major role. Callan is by, by and far the major character who has the lion's share of everything. But she does play a very interesting uh submissive kind of secretary but she's smart uh, interesting character anyhow worth worth this to Callum one and two and we also chatted too about um survivors can i say her episode in survivors box at eight um is just chilling so and if you know, listen to much survivors survivors about a pandemic that breaks out and only one out of every thousand people survive and so it's about the survivors it is a really bleak tale and every box set has at least one episode which takes a character through the death which is when when the virus is spreading around the whole world and what happens to them and how they get through it and the experiences and so jane's written that death episode for box set eight and it really is worth listening to but it is very bleak but yeah so have a listen to some of jane's writing it's great Excellent. Thank you very much, Philip. I um, really appreciate um, that discussion. And uh, we're having some great discussions lately, aren't we? Well, we've had some amazing discussions and there's some more to come. So, yeah, keep Ooh. listening. Oh, what's going to be next? If you want to send us some feedback, you can do that at sirensofaudio at gmail.com. Find us on Twitter at Audio Sirens. We're on Facebook as well. And our website is sirensofaudio.com. It's pretty complicated, but we're all there. We're there. We're there somewhere. You should be able to find us. And if you're enjoying these interviews and the people we're chatting with, it'd be great for you to rate and review us so more people can find us. So feel free to pop onto your podcast and give us a rating, ideally five star, and say something. And we, we might even read out some nice comments about it. All right. Thanks for that, Philip. And uh, we will catch you next time for another installment of the Sirens of Audio. Bye. Bye.